This week on Not Sam Wrestling, Matt Tremont joins me to talk about the world of deathmatch wrestling and getting Onita to the United States of America. We preview Clash of Champions. We recap what happened at the Not Sam Wrestling live show. This is it. Not Sam Wrestling. This is Not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Oh, welcome back. Welcome to Not Sam Wrestling. It's going to be a great show today, as it always is. It was really great seeing so many uh, of the WWE superstars posting pictures of the Fink on their social media. I guess he was uh, backstage at Raw on Monday at Madison Square Garden. And a lot of the WWE superstars who were there were posting pictures. And uh, I saw uh, the Fink visited the, the Maestro's beard trimming barber station that they set up backstage at WWE shows. He looked like a million bucks. I'm so happy to see him out and about. The Fink is just, he's one of the greatest guys you could ever ask to meet. Well, welcome to the show. Welcome to Not Sam Wrestling. First of all, thanks to everybody that showed up uh, over the weekend to Caroline's on Broadway in New York City. Got to be a part of the live Not Sam Wrestling show. It was an amazing night. So I, I the stories. So uh, the lineup ended up being, and I'll tell you, the lineup ended up being uh, Kathy Kelly, it was Mark Henry, and it was Drake Maverick. All there live at Caroline's. And look, these shows are not easy to book. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to throw a pity party for myself. But like, I'm reaching out to everybody personally. A lot of it, you know, travel is up in the air. It's not the easiest thing in the world to be a professional wrestler. So, uh, you know, a lot of it is whether they're in town, whether they're not going to be in town, when they are going to get in town. There were several people that were trying to make it straight to Caroline's from the airport, but there was bad traffic. So that stopped some people. Uh, some people were supposed to be there, and I, I had to switch out at the last minute. So, but, but it was great. All's well that ends well, and it ended up being great. Um, we got to poke fun at Kathy Kelly for some of her Twitter replies. D- the stories that came from Drake Maverick, just stories of... Uh, well, I mean, I, I I don't know how many of them he wants on the podcast. I don't know uh, exactly what we're going to do with the audio and video that we did take at Caroline's. I can't guarantee that the whole thing, by any stretch of the imagination, is going to end up here on the podcast. That's why you got to be a part of these live shows. Um, but amazing stories uh, from Drake Maverick uh, about the 24-7 championship, uh, the whole story behind his wedding uh, and filming there. The whole thing was really, really great. And then five minutes of stand-up comedy. Not safe for work, not TV-friendly stand-up comedy from the world's strongest man, Mark Henry. And he said that was a dream of his for a long time. He's wanted to do stand-up. And he did a strong, solid, tight, flaming hot five minutes. Uh, It was a really, really good time. Uh, I saw uh, one couple won tickets to SmackDown live at Madison Square Garden. Um, meeting a bunch of you at the meet and greet was super fun. So I was, I was super happy with it. And I'm glad so many of you came out and checked out the live show. It was super fun. Um, I want to, we'll talk about Clash of Champions. Uh, we are going to do a post show for Clash of Champions over on Patreon. We'll talk about that in the state of wrestling. But this week, uh, for our interview segment, I wanted to bring on somebody that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, Matt Tremont is a guy who, I think probably has gained most of his notoriety in CZW, uh, an independent promotion here on the East Coast, but also has an independent promotion based out of Jersey um, called uh, H2O, Hardcore Hustle Organization, um, which is his own uh, wrestling promotion that has a lot of uh, hardcore wrestling, some deathmatch stuff, but also regular wrestling, a ton of stuff. Um, But Matt, I got to see... And he's wrestled everybody, you know. He's had matches with Matt Riddle. He's had matches with everybody. Just Google him. Look up his matches. This is a guy who's been around the block for about 10 years. And uh, he's done some incredible th- things. He was uh, trying to get uh, Cody to have a match with him before his before Cody started uh, AEW. He's got a whole bunch of ideas. But this guy, uh, he brought a, a Japanese deathmatch legend named uh, Onita to the United States. And it was the first time Onita had been in the United States in many years. And he and he started calling him out on a show and started posting promos on YouTube calling out Onita. And eventually, Onita came over to the United States. He never comes to the U.S. But he came over, 
and he wrestled a no ropes, barbed wire, exploding baseball bat match in New Jersey against Matt Tremont uh, and uh, uh, Tremont. And I got to go and sit in the audience live. Uh, it was a CZW show called Once in a Lifetime. It was a couple years ago. And I mean, if you look at the DVD of it, I got my aisle seat. I'm in the third row. I'm all over the thing. And it was just, I bought my ticket. I went, I sat down and I had the time of my life because when I was a kid growing up in high school, really, I loved deathmatch wrestling. It's what, one of the things that got me into tape trading. I just, I started, I got a, a I had heard about the IWA King of the Deathmatch, IWA Japan King of the Je- Deathmatch. That's the Kawasaki Dream Show um, where the finals was Terry Funk versus Cactus Jack. It's the match. It's the very, very infamous Cactus Jack match. It's the talked about, Mick Foley talks about it a lot in his book. Very, very influential in his career and very, very influential in deathmatch wrestling in general. Um, after I saw that, I ended up getting a, I got a VHS tape of the King of the Death match, and then I ended up getting a VHS tape at, at some like local independent wrestling show that was just the best of Cactus Jack and Terry Funk in Japan. And I started looking at what they were doing over there. And that's when I started getting like the big Japan shows, which was the Piranha Death match and the Cactus Death match and the Pool Death match and all this stuff and FMW shows. Um, and then. You know, I started uh, paying attention to who it was, and Mr. Pogo, and 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 Mike Awesome, of course, uh, Gladiator, and the guy that stuck out was Onita. Onita is like in Japan, the equivalent of Hulk Hogan to deathmatch wrestling, specifically, uh, exploding ring matches. It was all Onita. I ended up getting all the best of Onita tapes, um, and I when I finally got to meet Onita at this CZW show, I actually found my RF video, I had bought it straight from RF video, the best of Explosion Death Matches Volume 2, and I got Onita to sign my VHS tape. It's one of my favorite things ever. The picture I took with him and the and the VHS tape signed by him, just two of my favorite things ever. Um, but I loved that Matt Tremont was able to pull it off. And I love that in 2019, guys like Matt Tremont are pushing forward the deathmatch agenda in the world of pro wrestling and and creating this genre of pro wrestling that is available to the people who want it. You know, I mean, technology has made everything so niche that if you don't like deathmatch wrestling, you don't have to watch it. And if you do like it, it can be made available for you. And that's what guys like Matt Tremont are doing. So I had Matt Tremont down here in the Not Sam studio to kind of tell his story, to talk about how he got Onita to come to the United States, to talk about how he got involved in deathmatch wrestling in general, to talk about the criticisms of deathmatch wrestling and how some people don't take it seriously, to talk about all this and more. My guest this week on Not Sam Wrestling, somebody I've wanted to have on the podcast for a long time and somebody who I think you guys are going to think is hella interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, he's the bulldozer, Matt Tremont. The Not Sam Wrestling Interview. For the very first time in the Not Sam studio, let me get your mic up, ladies and gentlemen, there it is, Matt Tremont is here, what's going on man, what's the haps? I'm good man. I'm, I'm glad excited. you're here, I'm excited to have you here, we've been meaning to do this so like, and and I've talked about this before, but the it was like two years ago I guess mm-hmm. at this point, maybe it was even more, that Onita came to the States because yeah. like... When I was, whether anybody believes it or not, I was a tape trader mm-hmm. in, in high school. And like, uh, I, start, I, f- I found Onita when I was like, I don't know, I was probably a freshman or sophomore in high school, whenever mm-hmm. that was. And like, that's really, it started, I started with kind of deathmatch wrestling, where I think a lot of people start with the IWA Japan 95 yeah. tournament, because you heard about that from... Mankind and all mm-hmm. that stuff, right? And then I, I feel like just as I started to go like an inch deeper, that's where I found Onita and all this, all that, everything else. You know what I mean? After yeah. that, everything kind of follows. And I hadn't thought about it in a long time. And I start seeing stuff online that first I saw the kind of buildup where you started calling out Onita. Yeah. Right? And you and I was like, okay, like I figured <laughs> you were just trying to get attention. Yeah. Which I was like, good for him. Like, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and then when like it started getting advertised, no, Onita's coming. I was like, come on. Yeah. And then like, I mean, I waited until 
like a couple days before and there was no cancellation there was no yeah. it's happening and i started like researching i was like yeah he's he was in america like once mm -hmm. years ago and it was in california yeah and so i'm going like he's coming and he's wrestling so i was like screw it and it was like i went right back to being in high school i went online I bought a ticket. Mm -hmm. I showed up early. I stood in line for the meet and greet. Yep, yep. I did the whole thing, and like you could see it on the DVD. I'm sitting there and like I'm like with an aisle seat, like yeah. clapping along and everything. And it was like one of my favorite experiences as a fan, like especially as an adult fan. Mm. So I want to start there. Like, how did you end up in the scenario where you and CZW yeah. got Onita? to the states not just for a signing not just for a match mm -hmm. and it was a bar it was it was a barbed wire yeah <laughs> full-fledged onita death match it was awesome but how did it how did it happen it was the whole the the idea itself czw wasn't even uh in the picture when i first thought of it my intention was i've done all this you know in almost 13 years in wrestling now as far as the genre of deathmatch wrestling goes yeah won all the tournaments traveled here and there but the mecca that all americans strive for is to go to japan mm -hmm. i didn't get to japan yet i wanted to go to japan and, and get crazy over there so i talked to a i'm like what do i need to do to get to the the attention of japan and i was at a beyond wrestling show i talked to steve monster mac yeah, and I'm like, Matt, love, love him. What can I do to generate some interest to get to Japan? And he's like, just do what Taz did, shoot, call people out. And I'm like, all right. Well, if I'm gonna call anybody out, I'm gonna call out the the God Himself, <laughs> uh, because that's who I grew up on watching tapes and you know downloading clips off Kazaa and all yeah, the yeah, yeah. places. So I'm like, I'm gonna call out Onita. Uh, came out with the catchphrase, Japan is scared. Yeah. So like, they didn't want me to come over there. I was too violent. And I'm going to call out Onita. And I think the first promo that I did, I just got done three rounds of a deathmatch tournament in West Virginia. I was feeling it, and I asked the camera guy, Chris Grasso, I'm like, hey, man, can your camera film video as well? He's like, yes. I'm like, I'm in the zone. Let's film a promo. Because I would imagine, and we'll get into all of it, mm. but like in that scenario where you've just gone, if it's a tournament, you're doing, that's three deathmatches. Yeah. So you not only physically do you look just beaten and bloodied and yeah. you've been through hell but i have to imagine like the adrenaline is sky 100 percent. yeah okay i'm on yeah i'm uh, even though i'm dead inside because yeah. i'm just three round tournaments are they're grueling right uh but i'm like i'm feeling it right now so right. Just, it hasn't caught up with you yet no like, no, you're still right yeah. right we gotta uh, do I, it right now it was probably no less than five minutes after the match. i mm -hmm. was literally walking down the hallway Onita's on my mind because I knew I wanted to do something to get it out there. And I'm like, Grasso, follow me. Promo now. And we, we filmed it. I put it right online as soon as I got home. This was in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. As soon as I got home, I put it up. And I guess that was the first, you know, interest. And everybody's like, what are you doing calling out Onita? I've never talked to the guy. You know, never met him. You know, this is just fanboy Onita. Uh... You know, I mean, at the time, out. he really wasn't even doing conventions over here. He wasn't coming no, over here. Nothing. Yeah. He's an, I mean, like you said, he was the one time for California for XPW. Yeah. And he made that, I think, one appearance at the arena. It was yeah. like a run in. He, he, he was in sandals. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, he's we were the promotion to finally give get him over here. Um, so I put the, the promo out. Uh, then I, you know, wound up talking to DJ, and then it, everyone's hit me up, and they're like, "Why are you shoot calling out Onita?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I want to get to Japan. That was my goal. The WrestleMania, going to Japan is my WrestleMania, my Bound for Glory, whatever you want to call it." Yeah. So I'm like, "This is what I got to do," and it started to pick up some traction, and you know, I guess the early logistical legwork I did. Then when it came to the finances and business, I knew I couldn't pull that off on my end. So I'm like, I need a promotion to help back me. And that's where DJ High and CCW was. Wow. And so what? I mean, the promo comes out. The, the, Onita and the people in Japan are just going like, oh, there could be some business here. Like, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. And then they were just, you, it was just timing. Like, they were like, we're we're willing to do this now. It was a DM on Twitter from Onita. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's him and either uh, his wife that runs it. Yeah. Uh, 
or uh, Pandita, one of his young boys mm -hmm. uh, that runs it. So it was a DM. They're like, I, I forget the ex what they exactly said, uh, but they're like they shoot they shown interest, and luckily the very influential person that made everything happen mm -hmm. was uh, Tony Myers, Chainsaw Tony, because mm -hmm. he was from the states. He knew of me. And uh, he's been working with Onita for the last three, four years over there under that gimmick. And I, I still have my wrestling collectible store in the Berlin Mart. Uh -huh. And Tony and a few guys stopped by. And he, you know, we, we chatted for a little bit. And he was just about to go back to Japan. So he wanted to meet, meet the kid who's been calling out Onita, who he has no idea who he is. And he was the one to go back to Japan like, hey... Seems like a genuine person. He's just trying to generate some some interest. He really wants to go to Japan. Uh, he's not shooting on you. He doesn't hate you. He's just a really big fan of yours. And I think that really, you know, helped Onita. Like, okay, like... Like you're doing it out of respect. Yes, and like you're the You're the man. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I, I think that's when I would get the DM. And then as soon as I got that DM, I was sitting at my store at the time. Uh, the wife was with me. I showed her, and I'm like, oh, Nita just got back to me. This is nuts. <laughs> and it me, one, as soon as he hit me up, I called DJ right away. Yeah. I'm like, I, I, he's interested. Let's make this happen. Uh, and we didn't even come up with the name once in a lifetime yet, but in my head, I'm like, oh, as talking to DJ, I'm like, this is a once in a lifetime type thing. Let's yeah, I mean, like you happen. said, this is your WrestleMania. You have John Cena in the Rock at WrestleMania. Yeah. For the deathmatch world, mm. it's you and Onita, right? It's crazy, right? Crazy, yeah. So when you so when you got the DM, first of all, like it, uh, the fact that so it happens weird. over DM, but yeah. you know, people say what they want about Twitter, mm -hmm. and I mean that's where Twitter is so great. You know, you know what I mean? Because as much nonsense as you have to deal with, it allows you to connect with people, yeah. just like that. That maybe it would have been more difficult mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, but so was it his idea to be like, yeah, I know you want to come to Japan and we'll bring you over, but why don't I come to the States? Pretty much he was like, because his goal was to come over here and, and finally wrestle here. Yeah. And, I mean, he had matches years ago in Memphis, so it's been 20, 25 years since he actually had a match. Um, so I guess once DJ and Anita started talking and, and other parties started talking, they're like, all right, we will bring you guys so I, that wasn't even in my mind. I'm like, I'm just trying to go to Japan. Right. So once they started talking and DJ gets back to me, he's like, oh, we're going to bring him here. I'm like, okay, okay cool. <laughs> um, so Japan was kind of not even talked about now. Yeah, so you go like, okay, I mean, this is still a dream scenario because I get to wrestle Onita, but mm -hmm. I mean, the whole reason I started this was to go to Japan. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it got flip-flop, but I was cool with it. Yeah. I'm not going to complain. Um, so yeah, then... Talks began, and this was probably February, March mm -hmm. that year. And once we get to April Mania weekend, I believe this was Florida, Orlando that yeah, year. Yeah, it seems about right. Uh, CZW was running Best of the Best, and going into that show Mania weekend, they just like, we're going to announce it Mania weekend down there. So I wrestled Pentagon on Best of the Best, and once the match was over is when uh, they played the video when that popped up and the then just Onita and big letters, big pop from the crowd, goosebumps from me on my end. Yeah. And just very surreal. Yeah, surreal. I mean, I, I would imagine it was just crazy. So was there any, because there was a lot of, 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 I don't know if it's speculation, but there were a lot of doubters that were going like, well, you know, Onita's no-showed before. Yeah. And I mean, like, and that's why I said, like, I waited until the last minute to buy my tickets just in case it got canceled. Yeah. Because a lot of people were like, you don't know at the last minute he was supposed to be here he was supposed to be there he does mm -hmm. this he does that by the way like not only was he there but when I met him he like he couldn't have been a nicer guy yeah. but were you at all worried that like ah he's gonna change his mind I think we all were yeah I think it was it, especially that last four or five days leading up to the event I would hit up DJ every hour when's the last <laughs> time you talked to him have you heard from him uh, and then especially the, the day of yeah. I'm like alright did he get on the plane uh when's he landing so yeah just like you said because he you know didn't make those appearances years ago it was really smart too that you guys were all like tweeting out here he is in the airport yeah his plane landed yes. like you yeah. were like so we were all on yeah. that ride with I, you guys I, I think all the fans were and skeptical of like right you know 
especially you know because they up ticket prices for that show like it was of course it was a big know, deal so like if you're going to spend that money this dude better be here right so i completely understand on that end i hate to interrupt but real quick i want to talk to you guys about better help if there's something interfering with your happiness, if there's something preventing you from achieving your goals, if there's a little voice in your head telling you you're not going to be able to get it done, if there's a feeling in your gut that's letting you know this isn't going to happen, if the anxiety, that's what happens to me, if the anxiety is just weighing you down and stopping you from progressing to where you want to be, BetterHelp is for you. You see, BetterHelp assesses your needs and then they match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with them in under 24 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling. And it's done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network, which may or may not be locally available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide. So if you can't find the right professional for you where you're at, BetterHelp is going to be where you can. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. It can get very, very awkward. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read some of their testimonials that are posted daily. You won't believe it. Visit BetterHelp.com slash NotSam. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash not Sam and join over 500,000 people that are taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional special offer for not Sam wrestling listeners. You get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash not Sam. Were you happy with the way that the first match went? I mean, you know, I thought it was great. And that was the other speculation going in. I remember people are going to be like, no, it's going to be a six man, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for me as a fan, and this is legit, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting here. Like, I thought the fact that it started one on one, I was like, I, I got what I came for. Yeah. You know what I mean? It did yeah. turn into the six man eventually. Mm -hmm. But I was like, you you guys were one on one for a solid however long it was. Yeah. It was a good chunk of time mm -hmm. though. It was a barbed wire match. It was like there was an explosion. It yeah. was the whole thing. I was like, no, I got what was advertised. Like mm -hmm. I got what was paid for. This was amazing. Were you happy with how it went? Overall, for me, one hundred percent. Yeah, I definitely felt because um, I, I would say two weeks before the show mm -hmm. is when we found out Onita didn't want to do the one on one. For many reasons, and I understood why he's old. You know, he's getting older. Because that's the other thing: when you're calling him out and you don't know him, mm -hmm. you don't know if he can still go, right? Yeah. And he's like, "Who's the, he? Don't know me. We've never worked, right? Is this young kid going to take care of this old man? Exactly. In the ring? Um, so, like, two weeks out is when we first heard inklings from his crew. It's going to be a six man. And up until this point in time, most of the matches that he's been doing in Japan have been six man tags, eight man tags. He has very seldom has he done a one on one within the last few years. Uh, once we found out it was a six man two weeks out, I think the one thing I, I would talk to DJ about is because the fans felt swerved. Mm -hmm. Kind of they, they wanted a one on one for a full from bell to bell one on one. Mm -hmm. And I, I can understand a little bit. Um, you know, maybe CZW could have handled it a little differently. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, like you said, and for me, if I was a paying customer, I would have been happy. Especially because in the back of my mind, I'm like, I don't even know if he's actually going to be here. Yeah. I don't even know if he's actually going to come to the ring. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like all this 100%. stuff. So, you know, I thought it was cool. So how do you then end up parlaying that you accomplish your goal mm -hmm. and you do go over to Japan? Um, that morning, we the morning of the show... Uh, was the first time I met him. He was across the street uh, at the hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, so DJ, I get a text from DJ saying, uh, "Meet at hotel. You'll meet Onita for the first time." So I'm like, I'm like a kid in a candy store right now. <laughs> uh, so we and the wife was with me, and uh, so we go and meet him at the hotel. He comes downstairs looking like a rock star, like he always does. Of course, and couldn't have been nicer. And we basically talked business of what we're going to do tonight. 
and that's when they presented to me Japan for the first time. So he's like, we'll do this tonight, and this will set up for you to come to Japan uh, to do a couple shows in October, two months after. And you're trying to play it cool, like like stop uh, yourself from smiling, like because you want to just like, yeah. like oh, yeah. oh, okay, this yeah. is yeah. yeah. Um, but you're like, yeah, okay, sounds good. Yeah, sounds trying good. To, <laughs> trying to play it cool, not mark out. Yeah. Um, but you know, so all this is happening. That's tonight. You know, we're talking now, setting up Japan. I'm just like, this is all I ever wanted. You know, after you know, years of putting my body on the line and doing all this stuff. So to right, right now to just nonchalantly just hanging out, eating br- breakfast with him, and then you know, getting ready to do this tonight, and now knowing, hey, in two months I'm going to go to Japan. Uh, I was like, all right, cool. That's amazing. <laughs> so when you started, like as a kid, I would imagine you grew up. With death matches around you, you were a CZW fan mm-hmm. first, right? Yes. And you went to the shows and everything. One hundred percent. So, was it a goal of yours? Are you going? I want to be a death match wrestler, or are you going? I want to be a wrestler, and then you fell into like, you know what? This is what I'm good at. My two, my first two VHS tapes: WrestleMania Five mm-hmm. and Kawasaki Dream, and I only got the Kawasaki Dream because I bought a box of tapes at a fle- Berlin flea market in yeah. Berlin, New Jersey. And I'm going through it, and it was in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I like, the first wrestling I ever saw was regular, regular traditional pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. Once I saw the hardcore stuff, it was very early on. I'm like, this is what I want to do. Uh, so I fell in love with it from the start. Um, and the first thing I saw was IWA Japan. So let me find more of this. Then you find FMW, find Onita. Uh you know, ECW. Yeah. And by the time I got into wrestling, uh, ECW was on its way out the door. Yeah. CZW was prevalent in the Northeast. And f- probably 2002 on, I was at CZW every month. That was giving me my ultraviolet fix of, of wrestling every month. And then when did you know, um, like, when did you drift in, uh, cross the bridge from fan to performer? To I think uh, 2006, uh-huh. I was a senior in high school, and I would, obviously I did the backyard wrestling and of doing all craziness in my mother's backyard that while she <laughs> yells at the window at me. Um, and I did that for a while, and I'm like, this is cool, but I'm like, I know I could make the step to the other side of the guardrail. And I, I had my, I started training with Primetime Amy Lee mm-hmm. uh, and a few other guys from the Philadelphia area. And January twenty seventh, two thousand seven, I made my pro wrestling debut. When did you get to a place where you were like, where you really felt confident with it, like where you didn't feel like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying here, or mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to prove people. When did you realize, like, nope, this is, this is what I do, this is what I was born to do. Like, I'm. I would say probably. Probably like six, seven years in, I finally, 2014, 2015, mm-hmm. once, um, once I won the CW title, mm-hmm. I knew like, man, the, co- the company's put me in this position, you know, for some reason. They see something in me to put this much stock into me to be the flagship of the company. And just, I think as, as, as far as performance in the ring, promo, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say like. Very early 2015, I'm like, man, I can do no wrong right now. I think everything's cooking on all cylinders. So by, like, even before 2015, like, by the, I would say, early to mid-first decade of the 2000s is mm-hmm. when death matches weren't cool anymore. You know what I mean? They, to, it was dying. It was dying. Yeah. You know, and, and I think people started to get sensitive about it, too. A lot more mm-hmm. people started to be like, well, this is senseless bloodletting, yeah. and this is, you know, and they started to almost be sensitive to the guys that were out there wanting to do it. You know what I mean? It's this weird thing where you're Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to see this person put himself through it. And he's like, but he wants you to see him put himself through it. That's why. So did you sit, did you go, I got to take this mantle and like bring it back? Or did you at any point go, maybe I shouldn't be doing this because it's starting to get out of style. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you, how did you deal with the idea that, this is going away, but this is what I want to do. I came in at the right place at the right time, even on a downscale of where deathmatch wrestling was. At the time, um, guys either retired from the genre, mm-hmm. uh, some guys passed away, mm-hmm. J.C. Bailey, brain damage, um, and it was kind of ra- ra- kind of around the time when, when, when Nick Gage got locked up mm-hmm. the first time. 
and I just came on the scene. So I was this fresh new guy. Well, there was no new faces in deathmatch wrestling. So with all those negatives, it kind of, you know, I was there and I'm like, okay, there, who, who's this Tremont kid? And I, you know, the first three, four years in the business, I did regular matches. And I was just waiting there for that opportunity to get booked to do a hardcore match or do a death match. And I finally got booked in South Jersey to do one. And that the the referee was Brett Lauderdale. He mm-hmm. runs GCW now. Um, he's like, hey, Carnage Cup, a crazy death match tournament in the middle of nowhere in Alabama is the next week. We'll see how you do tonight. I guess I did okay. Come on down to Alabama the next week. So you're doing your first death match. Yeah. You got your first death match. If you do okay, then a week later, we'll put you in a death match tournament. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I got thrown to a pack of wolves yeah. real quick. And I wrestled Danny Havoc in the first round. who's was one of the best to ever do it. How do people treat you at that point? Like when you're young in deathmatch world. Mm-hmm. So you've got a couple years of experience under your belt wrestling traditional style. So you know what you know what to do in the ring. Mm-hmm. But when you enter into deathmatch world, are there people that try to test you to see if you really want this? Or is it even more so like, you know what, we're all family here. Let's make sure the kid's taken care of. I think a little bit of both. It- the nicest people I've ever come across in wrestling are the hardcore guys. Mm-hmm. That's just how it is. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, in this genre, you better give it your all and give 110% and don't come in here half-assed. Uh, because it's, you're going to get hurt, somebody else is going to get hurt. Right. Um, and I knew when I wrestled, when I went to Alabama and I'm wrestling Danny Havoc in the first round, I already knew, I'm like, I know he's going to test me. He's going to push me to my limits because he just sees some young kid that wants to be an aspiring deathmatch wrestler. Uh, but it, it's, it takes a toll, and we're going to see if you want to do it. And it was brutal. What is testing like? Like, what, what, is it, what, what does he do to test you? I would say, it, you know, you're laying it in a little harder. You're right. Those forearm shots are a little harder. To so it's not even that. like he's taking like barbed wire or something and doing something else. It's just stiff hits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just seeing if you can keep up. Mm-hmm. See if you can take the brutality and still... That's so funny though because like, like we're sitting there going like, oh my God, look, he's got like a frying pan or a light tube or something. And you're like, yeah. just hit me with a light tube. Stop hitting <laughs> me with those forearms. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah he, you know, he tested me full on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I passed the test. And to this day, he's one of my best friends, Danny Havoc. And because of that, um, you know, Lauderdale, Danny Havoc, and a few others spoke up to DJ. And that's how I would get my job at CCW. So what do you do when, when, when that test is happening? Like, how do you pass? Do you take it? Do you hit back harder? Do you just understand where you're at? And You're, you're taking it. You're mm-hmm. giving it back yeah. to show, all right, you know, this kid can take it. And he's tough, too. He's going to give it right back to him. Right. So if you just take it, it's like, no, we don't need yeah. some kid that's just going to let us 100%. beat the crap out of him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, I, and then I think the the thing that I stuck out with was, you know, a little charisma. You mm-hmm. know, our kid can cut a promo. You know, he's not just a hack and slash. He just doesn't want to go in there and do, you know, garbage hardcore wrestling. Right. Because there's bad hardcore wrestling and there's... Good hardcore wrestling. Does that drive you crazy, the people that don't know the difference, the people that that don't understand that even in hardcore wrestling, even in deathmatch world, Mm -hmm. stories are still being told? 100%. Because, I mean, because really you do, I mean, you see bad hardcore wrestling. Yeah. And I think a lot of people just kind of put it all under an umbrella and go like, oh, you're one of these bad hardcore wrestlers without really kind of dipping into the genre and understanding. It's like anything else. There's bad regular wrestling, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know. I think. Um, I mean, I think overall many are very dismissive towards it. Mm-hmm. I don't think they give it a chance, and I and I understand it's not everybody's cup of tea. Mm-hmm. It's the, the, whether it's the blood or whatever it is, um, but I, you know, I'm like, just give it a chance. There's so many different styles of wrestling, especially now. Um, you know, I'm like, I just give it a chance. But I'm like, the guys that are good, the Danny have. When I was coming up. I got better because I worked with guys that were better than me, the Danny Havocs, Masadas, Drake Youngers, and those guys could implement the violence into telling their story. I'm like, okay, this is how it's done. It's not just ring the bell, trash can right to the head. When you see, <laughs> when you see Drake in a uh, in a referee shirt now, crazy. 
Do you sit there and go like, if these fans only knew? Yeah. If they only yeah. knew yeah. what was under that referee shirt. He's he was one of the best at a lot of crazy things over the years. Yeah. I'll, I'll anytime I see like I just saw uh, anytime Gulak. Yeah. Is on TV. I'm like, it's, it's crazy because just two three years ago, I'm like I I wrestled him. I worked with him. Yeah. And I had a match with him. And like all good people succeed in doing good things. And, and it's, pretty, it's cool pretty cool because like a f- ten years ago. These were all the guys that people were like, yeah, but WWE doesn't want people like that. Yeah, but yeah. these people, like, you know, the, they were, like, everybody was just, like, stuck in their positions. Mm-hmm. And now I think it is cool that we're at this place where, I think more so now than ever, all forms of wrestling are kind of accepted because they find their audiences. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't like a certain type of wrestling, you could just not watch it. Yeah. Because your audience could find you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because of the internet, because of various things. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the... Vice stuff helped you tremendously. You yeah. know what I mean? Just showing the world of what 2019 deathmatch wrestling looks like. Yeah. Uh, random people that I, I don't even know or I don't even think watch wrestling at all, I have been recognized. Hey, you were on Vice. Yeah. You put that big Kenzon thing in that other guy's head. I'm like, yes, I did that. To I that did poor that. gentleman. <laughs> yes. um, so, yeah, that, that, that Vice stock, things like that have, you know, helped you know, overall exposure wise greatly. Yeah. What was the first, when you're, when you start doing much more of the hardcore stuff, was there one first blow, whether it was with an object or whatever it was that you go like, Whoa, that sucked. (laughs) Uh, probably, uh, the, my first, I was in CZW probably four months Uh at this time. Uh, October, I'm good with dates. I'm wrestling a nerd with all that. But <laughs> October 2011, uh, my first main event for CZW. Uh-huh. I'm wrestling brain damage, uh-huh. and it's it's in. We are still wrestling at the ECW arena. Uh-huh. So I'm four months into the company. I'm main eventing, and I'm wrestling brain damage in the main event in the historic arena uh-huh. uh, against a guy who's like he he was CZW brain damage, uh-huh. and he hit me with the the water jug bat. It's on a stick, <laughs> and he molly me. And I just, it'll scramble your eggs pretty quick. And I'm like, oh, i got to shake that one off. But yeah. I remember, I think that was the first time I got hit with one of those. Been hit with plenty of them over the years. Right. But I just, yeah, first water jug bat shot did not feel pleasant. So it's not so much the stuff that, like, pierces the skin, right? It's not so much the cuts, it's the thuds. I, at least for me, yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Which is interesting, too, because, I mean, what looks like, sensational to the crowd mm-hmm. is the barbed wire and the tacks and the yeah. glass and, and the, all that stuff. Yeah. Is there an... You haven't had a ton of injuries, have you? Knock on wood, I've never broken a bone. It's in incredible. 13 years of doing craziness. Yeah. A lot of trips to the hospital for stitches and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, never, never no serious injuries. Does it, does it scare you? Like, for instance, like G-Rave, like just, you know, recently, mm-hmm. he was in a hardcore match and now he's got to get surgery on his arm right because he just took and it wasn't one of these like well he had this thing and that thing it was just it was some light tubes and some ladders and i mean to people outside the hardcore wrestling world that probably sounds insane but that's that's pretty standard yeah hardcore wrestling Mm -hmm. fair and you know something happens the wrong thing hits the wrong way Mm -hmm. and now he's got to get surgery which sucks and i've been really I, I've, I'm loving seeing the amount of people that are tweeting out awesome. like the GoFundMe's mm-hmm. and help this guy out. Let's let's get him through surgery and everything. But when you see that, does that remind you like oh like stuff happens like this is scary? Yeah, and it's it's it sucks because like the last two scary things that happened mm-hmm. both have been involved with Raver with uh, the incident last week mm-hmm. and then back at the NGI tournament in Atlantic City a few months ago. Uh, he took the bar the no rope barbed wire broke. As he took him, and he fell right to the ground and hit his head, which I had happened to me in 2012. Oh. I t- no rope barbed wire match with Masada. Mm-hmm. I got whipped into the barbed wire. It wasn't strung up right. It broke immediately, and my head smacked the floor. Oh. Man, man, Pondo was upstairs, and I'll never forget. He didn't tell me that the thud was so loud he heard it all the way upstairs. And this was in West Virginia. Pretty sure I was concussed. I didn't go to the hospital or nothing. But not yet cold. Yeah, not cold. I still finished the match when uh-huh. it was done. I wasn't. I knew I wasn't all there. Right. And then the the six hour ride home, just you know, every thirty minutes, getting up to get out of the car and puke and try to stay awake. Just but you remember it one hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of times like blows like that happen, and it's like all of a sudden you lose your short term memory. Okay. You know, and it's just like you know for that 
six hours or whatever. Yeah. Like, I've known people that have gotten concussed and, like, for six hours, they're just repeating the same questions over and over mm-hmm. again, and they just don't... Short-term memory just goes for that time. It comes yeah. back, obviously, okay. but it's a, it's a scary thing. It it's is. also, like... But that's the... I feel like there's so much kind of mystery left in hardcore wrestling because... Like, a fan wouldn't think that your worst fear is to miss the barbed wire. You know what I mean? Like, you're portraying, yeah. like, oh, no, I don't want to hit this barbed wire. Mm-hmm. But what would be worse is if the barbed wire broke. Yeah. And I didn't hit 100%. the barbed wire, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how does it, is it, is it just there's a, a way of stringing it up where you exit in the middle? Yeah, usually, like, obviously where the the ropes would go through on the post. Yeah. Uh, you know, they still string the barbed wire through and usually they'll do two or three two or three strands on each rope and then they'll exit and then usually usually the sides where you see on the no rope barbed wire that are x'd Mm -hmm. okay those are the sides we can take a little harder than the side that's just three strands sure um but not every you know czw gcw have very good you know, crews that know how to string up the barbed wire. Unsung heroes of deathmatch wrestling are guys like Shawnee, Tommy, uh, and Eugene, you know, for the last 15, 20 years, putting up these barbed wire matches. So I know when they're at a show, I'm like, okay, I, I'm safe in this not safe environment tonight. <laughs> um, but I've been in other promotions. They don't know how to put up the gimmicks. And right. And they're not as safe as elsewhere. And that's when things happen, like the raver or myself or anybody yeah yeah and i mean i guess it just happens the more experience you get i'm sure you can spot it but you never know right yeah yeah i mean what can you do um so you ne- did you ever really have a dream to be like that sort of mainstream wwe wrestlemania thing or was it like you said where you're like no i'm a, I'm a jersey kid mm-hmm. I, this is the wrestling that i like yeah and this is just where i'm gonna make my bones I would, yeah. I think. I mean, when we're little, we all got the aspirations of WrestleMania and all yeah. that. Well, we're all gonna be Hulk Hogan, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, you know, and he, Hogan was the first big star I saw as a kid. Like, like I said, my first tape was WrestleMania Five. Yeah. I'm a South Jersey kid. That was in Atlantic City. I wore that tape out crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, like my my only initial first goal when I once I started, you know, once I'm in the business a couple of years, I'm like CZW was my goal. Mm-hmm. That was the biggest promotion at the time, doing this style and genre of wrestling. I knew that was my goal. I wanted to become champion there, win tournament in depth there, you know, main event there, and just be a big player there. And I did that. And because of the platform that I got at CZW, I was able to do a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. Which I'll tell people just it's just an extra, you know, icing on the cake a lot of the time. So being able to, you know, travel the states. And Japan, Mexico, uh, Germany, Canada, all icing on the cake. So, mm-hmm. so it's just been all extra, nothing but good. But yeah, that, that was my goal. I, I wanted to, you know, uh, you know, do the hardcore style, and you know, yeah, like you said, that South yeah. Jersey kid, and that just wanted to be hardcore. When did you realize it was time to kind of uh, do your own thing, part ways with CCW? Uh, when we, so last last summer. The company has changed a lot, mm-hmm. and for m- many reasons. I, that could be a whole podcast, <laughs> good and bad. Uh-huh. Uh, but to wrap it, you know, to make it a, a long story short, um, last summer, a lot of things changed in the company, um, and I didn't, I wasn't a fan of it. Mm-hmm. And at this time, I have some tenure there. I'm one of the, you know, I'm looking in the locker room now, and I'm the I'm the old guy in the locker room now. I didn't know too many people. I didn't like what was going on, so I I parted ways. I told DJ, I'm like, this this will be my last match. Let me work with this guy. Let me do good business on the way out and put somebody up, and you got and make hopefully make a new star. And I parted ways. I had no uh, intentions on never returning. Mm-hmm. And then last December, Onita hits me up, <laughs> and I'm like. <laughs> Well, I guess I got to go back now. And I've been back since last December. Uh-huh. Everything's been cool. Yeah. And the, the company's in a, uh, you know, I wouldn't say a rebirth is the right word, but definitely a time where the CW's trying to find their identity again. Yeah. Uh, because they went through a lot of stuff the last couple of years. So um, I'm glad to be there. It's definitely not the same promotion it once was. It's right. not, 
you know, the, the emphasis isn't on the ultraviolence. And I, I wouldn't say it always was. I think that was always in people's minds that CCW was just hardcore blood and guts. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, no, there's a lot of really good wrestling here, too. There was maybe one or two hardcore matches on the card, mm-hmm. but those were necessary because that's the you know genre we're doing and people that are buying a ticket. Yeah, um, I mean Gulak was. Yeah, <laughs> Gulak was doing like basically amateur wrestling in yeah. CCW, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, been back now and, and everything's been good. So now I'm. It's just uh, I'm in a different position there now, opposed to you know, the green kid that started there years ago, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm the old guy sitting in yeah. the locker room now, you know, giving advice and helping out. And um, do you feel like maybe, cause sometimes parting ways and then coming back, it's like, it kind of gives everybody that refresher where you're not, cause otherwise you're to some people, you're still that green kid, right? Yes. Cause you haven't left. You've been there the whole time. Yeah. Once yes. you leave, you start investing in your own promotion. Mm-hmm. You start, you know, you maintain your name outside of CZW. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, Right, well, let's bring him back because he's an asset. Yeah. Right, he's not just... 100%. Yeah. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's been good since, you know, I've been back there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I think it has the potential to get back to, to where it was and because the company's been around 20-something years. Well, that's the wildest thing, right? It's crazy. I mean, regardless <laughs> of the ups and downs and, like, whether it's like, ah, it's not quite as good or it has its errors. Yeah. It has its, you know, it has its time when it's not good. Yeah. But, like... I mean, I remember buying the first CZW tapes on VHS mm-hmm. with the computer printed label. Yep. You know, it was just as ECW yeah. was going down. Yeah. See, here's CZW, and it's like, it's still around. Like, just that it exists anymore, it still, still is incredible. Still doing its thing. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So, when did you decide to start doing your own promotion and, and, and entering into that realm? Man, since day one, I've always, as a kid, booked cards, promoted fake cards, and, you know, whatever. Um, before I launched H2O, but me and a buddy of mine started uh, On Point Wrestling. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot doing that. And then I knew we did that from 2013 to about 2017. Uh, no, 2016. And then I knew, I'm like, all right, I gained this knowledge. We worked together. But at the end of the day, it was his baby. It was his vision. I was helping him. I had my own vision and I wanted to do things, you know, how I wanted to do things myself. Uh, So, you know, came up with H2O, the Hardcore Hustle organization. We launched in 2016. And at the time, it was just something fun. Mm -hmm. Just some, we we did two shows in the first year. Mm -hmm. So it was just something fun to do, um, hang out with the boys, you know, give the boys another payday and just hang out and put on some fun shows. And then everything started to evolve and, you know, we were gaining some traction and a year ago, last month, a year ago is when everything completely changed for me, you know, in life and in wrestling. Uh, H2O, the, the building we run now, uh, we were just renting. Every mm-hmm. every few months we'd run a show. Uh, and this was, the building was o- o- OTW, Old Time Wrestling, ran by former ECW referee Jim Molino. Right. Um, Jim's a good friend and did good business over the last few years, renting his place, so on and so forth. And Jim hit me up randomly one day. He's like, uh, Matt, can't do it no more. I'm like, what in the, what's going on? Uh, he's like, you know, we're, uh, I'm going to move out of the building. And the opportunity is there for you to move in. And I'm like, all right, cool. And so, you know, called the landlord and all that. And they're like, ah, $5,500 to move in. I told, I'm like, I didn't have a pot to piss in at the time. I'm like, <laughs> I don't have five grand, you know, to pull out of me. But I knew, I'm like, if we can get, if we can move into this building, this can be our foundation. We can run consistently now, so more content. Yeah. Uh, I can open up a school. You know, we can do rentals, the birthday party gimmick, you know, right. all, all that stuff. All the revenue streams start to open up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just knew, I looked. Is you that, do barbed wire birthdays. That'd be all right. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> I knew, I'm like, all right, if we can get in here, this can be a foundation for a lot of things. Um, I pretty much, like I said, I didn't have that money. I don't, you know, never had that kind of money in my life. I sold everything I had, even uh, deathmatch tournament trophies that I won over the Uh. years. I sold them all. I'm like, I didn't want to, but I'm like, man, this is a huge step for me and and this company. Yeah. So any kind of personal memorabilia. That I knew I had some value I could sell. Yeah. Uh, sold to certain people that I knew will appreciate it and right. keep it. So, you know, and was able to, to get the money together. We moved in. And now a year later, uh, we're running consistently every month. 
Um, we, we, myself and Preacher Vinius James run the H2O Wrestling Academy. Mm-hmm. We have 24 students enrolled in the school right now. Half of them are now wrestling. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's my full time since 20, I would say 2016, you know, wrestling has been a full time gig for me, whether, you know, my wrestling and my schedule and then running the day to day logistics of, of H2O wrestling. Right. So that I haven't had to have a regular quote, you know, nine to five job. Yeah. So like, and, and then we moved into our facility. So like I'm home, everything's here. And I'm able to, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm not making a million dollars, but I'm, we're, you know. If, You're able to well, get by. Yeah. That's it. Know, I mean, the, the you can get by doing wrestling. Like, yeah, that's yeah. the dream, right? As long as the bills are paid, the wife's happy and the dog has food. Yeah. I'm happy. It's so like, yeah, we're, we're making enough to get by, you know, run H2O, make sure we're, we're taking care of the boys at the end of the night and, and, and paying them. Maybe uh, eventually get enough money to buy back some of those deathmatch trophies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, so yeah, all I had seven of them, so I sold all seven. Yeah. Um, and I do, but I just won my eighth one in California. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm. I'm gonna keep this that one. one. I don't have to do nothing with this one. Does it drive you crazy <laughs> when you hear the story that like Foley lost? His Kawasaki Dream Trophy Crazy. immediately. Beautiful trophy. And too. it's gone. Yeah. I mean, that's like... And has it ever turned up anywhere? Have you ever heard of it uh, ever turning no, up? Not at all. Because that's like the deathmatch yes. trophy, right? Yeah. That would be the piece of memorabilia. Yeah. Did you save anything from your Onita match, the first one or any of them? Um, the exploding bats. Mm-hmm. I have one of the exploding bats. That's awesome. I had to keep one of them. You had to. Um, uh, turnbuckle pad from the show. That's awesome. And... Uh, the banner. I had a once in a lifetime banner. Mm-hmm. Made, me and him on it. Oh yeah. Kept that as well. Um, shout out to the struggles. He designed that for me. Um, I, th- I think that's about it. That's yeah. badass though. I had to keep something. Yeah. Um, is it? Else. Is there anything that you're gonna like one day? Like, are is there any? I don't want to call it a stunt and like in a diminutive way, but like Mm -hmm. any sort of spot, I guess, like, is there any moment from a death match that you participated in that you feel like this is like you would put in a tape or pull it up on YouTube, whatever, whatever, however you do it in 2019. I don't want to date myself. (laughs) Like you'd go, like if you had a kid, right? Yeah. You're like, this is what I did. Like, is there something that you would show them to be like, um, I probably two clips. Mm -hmm. One would, I guess most infamous big spot that I did was, Cage Death 14, uh, me and DJ hide on top of the Cage Death, mm-hmm. and I gave him a Death Valley driver off the top of the cage, threw three panes of glass to the floor at the skate zone of Voorhees. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I recently just got the footage from my match with Onita in Japan, uh-huh. which was a five-on-five uh, no-rope barbed wire explosion match. So I have the clip of me taking the explosion no-rope barbed wire. So either of those two clips, I guess, yeah, here, yeah. Here, check these out. That's awesome, yeah. man. That's awesome. So what you you after Onita you called out Cody. This was before AEW had started. Yeah. But you called out Cody mm-hmm. and he responded, right, that he was doing there was other stuff going on, yeah. but one day he'd like to. Yeah. Um is there any what else are you looking for? You know what I mean? I feel like you're in this like really cool place right now because mm-hmm. you went through that sort of like my childhood dream, right? Like you got that. You got the Onita stuff, and then you went to Japan. Like, you got it. Now, it's like, okay, my adult dream. Make a living mm-hmm. just doing wrestling. Got it. Yeah. So, like, what's... What do you look What do you look towards now? Like, what is something that you're like, I gotta get this done? The, the wife probably hears me talk about it every day now, because, like, I've kind of been at that crossroads yeah. the last year. Mm-hmm. Just like you said, it's crazy because i'm i think about it every day now i'm like all right you know i did what i wanted to do professionally Mm -hmm. i did what i needed to do professionally and personally to take care of myself and the family so like we're good now and 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 then building h2o so i'm like all that's good right now Mm -hmm. so everything's everything's chill everything's doing what needs to do Mm -hmm. so lately i have been in that position i'm like sitting back i'm like what is what is continuing to motivate me to yeah. one to keep doing the craziness? Yeah, and I did slow down the last year, so I can continue to do it for another five to ten years. Right, so you can be so you, your body's ready when it counts. Yeah, right. Because uh, for I wish I listened to Danny Havocs and all of them a lot earlier when they were telling me to slow down. Because mm-hmm. uh, I got I got pretty beat up, you know, those years. It, like again, never no broken bones, but I, I was feeling it in the last couple of years. What do you think it is that really like? 
has that lingering effect? Like what, what is doing? Is it just a, a, an amalgamation of everything, or is there something that like if you do this over and over and over again, mm -hmm. like your body is just gonna tell you I th stop, whether you want to or not? Yeah. I'm not cooperating. I anymore. think it was a lot of the big bumps, taking the bumps off the kids' death and the scaffold bumps. So at the, the end of the day, that's the what floor. it is. It's the back, it's the knees, yeah, my, my, yeah. my lower back and my knees you know my the the, the fluid will build up on, in front of both my kneecaps all the time they're mm -hmm. burning uh my hip goes in and out every day so it, it was getting pretty bad pretty, i can't get out of bed myself in the morning the wife's got to pull me out wow uh, just because i can't physically get up normally i'm sorry there's <laughs> stairs leading to the studio man. <laughs> i always feel bad like i mean because that's not uncommon for wrestlers and i'm always every time like i'm bringing a wrestler to the studio and i'm like Ah, oh, the stairs. <laughs> like that sucks. <laughs> um, now I'm a lot better. I can I can slowly, gracefully get out of bed a little better uh -huh. now. Cause I just uh, last year I slowed down a lot. Yeah. Now I'm picking things back up. Um, but I back to the the question. I guess what's motivating me now? Like I put the Cody thing out because I'm like, all right, I called out Onita. Who else could I call out that mm -hmm. would gauge interest? And like you said, it was before AIDS. He's pretty busy now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know if the... I, although, I mean, like, look, I think it would be amazing if AEW figured out a way to, like, at a pay-per-view, do, yeah. like, a one-off death match yeah. to really make themselves different. Mm -hmm. I don't think Tony Khan would be into it. No. <laughs> right? <laughs> but even, even the match the match I would like to have with him is just, like, an old-school Texas bull rope match. Right, something like that. Cause like, even though I've done all do all the crazy death matches, I'm an old school wrestling fan at heart. I watch Memphis and World Class and old Georgia Championship wrestling all the time. So like, very old school fan at heart. So and like, at the end of the day, that's that hard hitting stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's yeah, it's, that's 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 the real stuff to me. Still, right. it still comes off. You know, holds up well today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the ma match with with Cody somewhere down the line would would be fantastic. Um, I think, and that two motivating things that you know to keep me going. There's so many outlets and platforms now mm -hmm. uh, with all these companies that have television. I, you know, the whole world. I've never been on TV, so I think that's the one thing. You know, um, MLW's TV, Impact, Ring of Honor, AEW. If I could just, you know, man, if you know, get on TV for six months. To show the world and 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 be able to sink my teeth into a, a six month angle and program and right. have promos and build up to something, that would be really cool. So I I hold out for that. Yeah. And then I think the other thing is, um, I think uh, Tim Storm, at the time was still NWA champion. Yeah. And they came to CZW at Cage of Death a couple of years ago. Yeah. And the NWA still owes me a shot. So that's what I, that's what ultimately that's what I want. I just, I want one shot. I'm at the NWA the, championship. At the, at, the, at the 10 pounds of gold and at the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. The the underdog kid from South Jersey, you know, uh, the deathmatch guy who, you know, the naysayers think can't wrestle. Yeah. But I, I think myself and, you know, Nick Aldis, you know, could have a hell of a match and tell a, a really good story. And I think it'd be something different. So, like, motivate me now. I just... One, one shot, one opportunity. At a the, shot at, at Nick the, Aldis. At the yeah. 10 pounds of gold, yeah. I love that, man. I love that. Hey, what does your wife and your family, like, what do they think of your matches? Like, <laughs> like is your wife watching your, your death matches? Is she got her eyes covered? Does she know enough to know that you're okay? In the beginning, um, definitely something she had to get used to. And like, what, what is all this? Yeah. This whole world. Um, yeah, she, she, she'll she she'll tell many times she's only cried twice. Uh, I think once uh, was at CZW, DJ gave me a choke slam mm -hmm. off a scaffolding structure above the ring, and it was a barbed wire net underneath. Oh, like the barbed wire trampoline type yeah, thing? Sort of. Kind of. Um, it was the tangled web match. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I literally was tangled in the wire. It ripped me to shreds oh. between my arm. It got my ass as well. Oh. <laughs> my cheeks, um, <laughs> my back, my head. I was, it tore me, one bump tore me to shreds. 
And I went to the hospital immediately after. I was at Virtua Hospital in Voorhees for nine hours, 136 stitches later. Just everywhere. From from that one bump. Looking like Frankenstein. Pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Four nurses at one time stitching me all back together. Did you take like full body pictures so you can get you with all the scars still, everywhere? I have a few of them. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, so that was once, and I, f- I forget the other time. But now it's to the point she's seen it all. <laughs> she's like, you good? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm like, okay. Here you <laughs> go. Yeah. Now we, oh, yeah, yes. what we were talking about yes. before with Pondo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what does it feel like, like, when you take a bump like that and you're just sliced everywhere? Like, do you even... Because, like, I think about, like, you know, I've had stitches one time. Yeah. It was when I was a kid. It was right here because some kid tripped me and I hit my head on a door. Mm-hmm. And, like, I went into a panic just, go like, knowing I had to go to the hospital. Yeah. And get like three stitches. I was like, oh, no, I don't want to get stitches. Yeah. No. When you are, take the one bump mm-hmm. and it's like on one end, you're like, okay, that's over. But you just, do you, is it too much for you to even comprehend that you're cut all over the place? Is a familiar feeling now because you've been in so many situations? Mm-hmm. Uh, I get back one instance, back to that bump I was just talking about. 136 stitches. Yeah. I took the bump. I'm literally laying and tangled in a wire. DJ, I'm looking up at DJ, who's on top of this the scaffold, uh-huh. and I give him a wink and a smile. <laughs> because the before the match we went out there, the old adage I used to say, I wanted to be hanging in the in the wire like Lobo. Yeah. He was an early CCW guy. Uh, him and Zandig's match years ago, he uh-huh. was hanging in the wire. I guess as crazy as it sounds, I wanted that visual. Uh So I knew once I took that crazy bump, I'm like, all right, I know I got all my bearings and all my limbs. I know I'm pretty cut up right now and I got to go to hospital, but I'm like, this is awesome. I got the moment. I guess it's crazy. I got the the moment. You know, the regular person walking down the street is going to think I'm a masochistic person and I I just, I don't enjoy getting cut or I cut myself or anything like that, but it's just... I don't know, just something about it, but I'm like... It really is yeah, funny when you talk about crazy. the normal person on the street, because I remember like in high school, I was dating a girl, and I gave her Mick Foley's book to kind of... She had no no familiarization at all with wrestling. She didn't mm-hmm. understand it, and I tried to tell her, like, there's levels of cooperation, like, there, this is a, you know, and, and try to explain it to her. And the first thing, and kind of, and I gave her Mick Foley's book, and she's mm-hmm. reading about, like, the how he came up and everything, and she goes... So is this like sadomasochism? And I'm like, no, it's not sexual. Like, no, it's yeah. not. It's not yeah. say. It's it's wrestling. It's yeah. it's a different deal. Um, in your school, can you train hardcore wrestling? Like, do you train <laughs> hardcore wrestling, or is it one of those trial by fire scenarios? Been getting that a lot lately. Yeah. Uh, one because it's called the Hardcore Hustle Organization, uh-huh. um, and I think a lot of my students um, have come to the school because they were fans of mine and fans of what I've done mm-hmm. and there's I would say out of our 20 something kids that we have three or four of them lately are, that have the itch and I'm like look I had the itch too but it'll come when you're ready for something like that um, the time will come but what we're doing here is training professional wrestlers I'm yeah. like you know we got some kids I'm like it's going to be a year before you even get in the ring. You're, you know, you're not getting in the ring and having your first match until you're physically ready, mentally ready. You got to be able to take care of yourself and someone else in, in that ring. You know, you got your lives in each other's hands. Then throw the hardcore wrestling on top of it. It's a whole nother world. So I, the couple kids that I know, uh, uh, GG, he's one of our students. He's he looks just like me. It's like a mini bulldozer, and he's like, he wants to do hardcore. We got another kid, nothing face. He wants to do hardcore, and then one of our students uh, took his he took a bump through a door for the first time at the last show. Yeah. Now he's like, can I do it all the time? Oh uh, so like, yeah. Oh, I gotta calm him down now. So I'm like, no, nah, we're not taking bumps on the concrete on Tuesday nights. <laughs> CZW school would have that, you know, years ago. Oh, go to the combat zone at Kamedy and you're bumping on the floor and taking light tubes. And mm. That's not what's happening. Yeah. You know, we're training people the right way, learning the You're ropes. actually giving them a foundation in wrestling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, before you, if, if I even give them the opportunity to do a hardcore match, they're going to have 
a solid foundation of the basics and the fundamentals and know be know how to wrestle and tell a story and work the crowd and do your basic one-on-one before i give you a steel chair and you start whacking each other with it that's awesome well man i'm glad you made the trip out here i'm glad you brought some dvds I would say they're giveaways, but I'm keeping them. <laughs> However, <laughs> they're for me. However, uh, I recommend everybody, if you're into hardcore deathmatch stuff, uh, H2O is your promotion. Uh, Matt Tremont, where else can people find you? What do you want to make people aware of? Uh, all my social media is at Tremont CZW. Mm-hmm. And yeah, man, just I, I, my blood, sweat, and tears goes into H2O, mm-hmm. you know, promoting, booking, running it. So yeah, you know, if you're in Williamstown, New Jersey... Come check us out. Hustle Mania, September 28th is our grandest stage of the mall show every year. So if you're in the area, come check out Hustle Mania. Love it, man. And this is the stuff that you should uh, be supporting. I mean, this is this is the grassroots. This is it. Uh, thank you, man, for uh, hanging. This has been you, great. Brother. Appreciate it. Hey, guys, just a quick time out because this is your last chance. You've been hearing me talk about Monday.com for the last few weeks. And this is it, your last chance for that two-week free trial. Take advantage of this opportunity. For free, you can see how Monday.com can save you crazy amounts of time at work. That's why if you have billable hours, I wouldn't recommend Monday.com. But if you don't, if you purposely want to be insufficient at work, Monday.com is not for you. In fact, it's really going to blow up your spot. You better hope your boss isn't listening to me right now. If you're sitting there searching through emails and you're trying to tell your boss, no, you got to pay me for all these hours. I got two things done all day today. Don't tell him about Monday.com because Monday.com is going to speed up all of those processes. If you're a normal human being, if you're just a person and you want to make your job easier and you want to be more productive at work, if you want to get more done, you've got to check out Monday.com. You see, Monday.com is an easy to use project management tool. The platform is suitable for any size team, whether it's you and hot dogs sitting on a couch or whether it's thousands of people collaborating from across the globe. It makes it easy to find everything. It makes it easier to keep everybody on their feet. It keeps everybody honest. There's no asking around, hey, who's doing what, and and, and when are you going to get done, and how much is finished, and oh, I hope he responds to my email. It tracks every project and everybody's progress on these projects. Like I said, The Monday.com people know how incredible this tool is, and that's why they're willing to let you try it for free. You're going to get hooked on being able to customize your workflows and remove miscommunications from your workday. Go right now to Monday.com slash NotSam, and you're going to get a free 14-day trial. This offer is only good for another month, so don't wait on this and continue wasting time at work. Go to monday.com slash not Sam. Get that 14-day trial and make sure you use that exact URL because if if you're using my URL, there's going to be additional savings if you choose to sign up. monday.com slash not Sam. Now let's get back to it. It's now time for this week's State of Wrestling. Yeah, it is time for this week's State of Wrestling. Here we go on Not Sam Wrestling. First of all, Hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Matt Tremont. Uh, one of my uh, uh, favorite current working deathmatch wrestlers. And just, I don't know, like, I know it's kind of like some people hate deathmatch wrestling and, and some people think it shouldn't exist. But as somebody that grew up with deathmatch wrestling and somebody who, you know, I mean, that's really what got my wheels spinning as a tape trader. Um, I, I feel like the guys who decide to make that their lives, I think they kind of deserve a little bit more credit, a little bit more respect maybe, Um, certainly a little bit more spotlight as a a serious form of this art known as pro wrestling, whether we're into it or not. So check out his stuff if you're into that kind of uh, ultra-violent, hardcore style. I will say that I was going through the DVDs that he brought, and it is possible, if not confirmed, that... uh, one of them has a bunch of blood on it, and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so I don't, not like in the picture. Like I don't think he realized on the cover of it, there's blood on it. It's definitely blood. It's not like it's red ink or anything. So you know, I have it. Like part of me is like, oh, but then a bigger part of me is like, well, I mean, if the king of American deathmatch wrestling 
gives you a, a DVD from his promotion and there's blood on it that's like somebody's real blood, that's kind of... That's like catching Hulk Hogan's shirt in the audience, no? I mean, that's that's kind of a big deal. That's the that's what you want. So I guess it's a collector's item now. Either way, I'm going to keep it out of reach of my small child. But I thank him so much for being here. I thought it was a really, really uh, great interview. I thought it was really fun. And I thought it was cool that I got to share that with you guys. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we've got a lot more to enjoy, though. We've got the top five stories of the week from the world of professional wrestling as I see it, the last professional broadcaster, Sam Roberts. If you got any problems with it, hit me up on Twitter at NotSam. Or, of course, if you're a Not Sam Shill on Patreon, you can leave a little comment on the uh, Patreon site or jump into the Discord room where 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we got people chatting wrestling. Uh, of course, the Discord room you get exclusive access to if you are a Not Sam Shill on any level Less than a dollar a week to start. So let's get it. And of course, you get the podcast early and ad free. So let's get into the uh, top five stories this week on Not Sam Wrestling. Uh, story number five is WWE's return to Madison Square Garden, which they had this week with Raw and SmackDown uh, coming live from the garden. A big, big deal in the sense that this was the first time in many, many years that WWE had done TV from Madison Square Garden. Not the first. They've been doing live events at Madison Square Garden. But not only was it Stone Cold there and The Undertaker there, but just having WWE TV there at all was a big deal. So uh, let's talk about how the TVs went. Um, I I don't necessarily want to get into the muck and mire of current storylines because we'll talk about a couple, I mean, pretty specifically to SmackDown a couple of the storylines that went down this week um, on Raw and SmackDown. So it's less about um, the shows themselves and more about the Madison Square Garden-ness of the shows and the legends that were featured on the shows. Um, You know, it's interesting because they just had Raw Reunion not too long ago, and they're gearing up to do the 20th anniversary of SmackDown to celebrate the debut episode on Fox, which I'm so excited about. Uh, But... Now to have Stone Cold on Raw this week, The Undertaker on SmackDown this week, it's like it gets to the point where you want to make sure that you're using your legends properly. And I was a little bit critical of how some of the legends were used at uh, Raw Reunion in the sense that really Mick Foley was used to put over a current guy. But other than that, the legends were just made to look like the stars, which, um, you know— I talked to Booker T about it. Go back and listen to the last uh, podcast because he gave me a lot of wisdom, I thought. Um, Booger T is a super smart guy, especially when it comes to wrestling, when it comes to just about anything, but really when it comes to wrestling, Booker T is a genius. And when I talked to him about it, he was right in the sense, and I talked to Stone Cold a little bit about it too. If you go back and listen to that podcast, uh, all the podcasts for the last five years, by the way, all available whenever you want to listen to them for free. So, um, I talked to him and he was talking about, and, and this is not only as it pertains to the conversation about Raw Reunion, but as it was uh, as it pertains to his conversation about Goldberg and Matt Riddle. Uh, and that is valuing the stars that came before you and the money that they drew, right? I think too often as fans, we think about wrestling as what happens in the squared circle who had the best match quality oh Goldberg was never a good wrestler but being a good wrestler really means getting people excited about what you're doing excited enough to spend money on what you're doing over the course of a period of time and Goldberg was exceptional at that Goldberg came in Goldberg extended WCW's life by a lot WCW I mean, they had Sting and DDP, and you could argue Lex Luger maybe too, but Luger went to the NWO. I I mean, the way that the NWO just ran over everybody in WCW, and the way that the Sting-Hogan match was completely destroyed in WCW, I mean, the greatest build ever to a match. I believe that the Sting-Hogan build I think the two best builds to matches ever, Hogan Macho WrestleMania 5, Sting Hogan, Starcade 97. 
Hogan Macho WrestleMania Five lived up to it. The match itself uh, was a great end to an amazing story. Starcade 97, because the end is so bad and because they messed it up, oh, something horrible, you know, with the finish being wonky and Bret Hart coming out and the referee was supposed to do a fast count, but he didn't do a fast count. And then Bret Hart called for the, it was just so, such a mess, such a horrible mess. It was to me, the first kind of steps in the end of WCW. But the reason the WCW didn't go quickly after that is because the next year following that sting debacle was the rise of Goldberg. You know, Goldberg was the first non-NWO creation after the NWO that really caught fire in WCW. You've got Sting, you got Diamond Dallas Page, you got the NWO, you got Goldberg. Those, to me, and maybe Booker T, but I feel like Booker T's legacy was really cemented in WWE. I feel like the previous guys are really what WCW contributed to wrestling. They started Booker T. They gave him his foundation. But I think that the, 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 the house was built with the stuff that he did in WWE, starting with the uh, Alliance stuff and his war with Stone Cold Steve Austin, going into King Booker, and then I think doing what he did in TNA and then coming back into the fold in WWE just made everybody appreciate Booker T even more. I think he's just got such a unique story, Booker T. But the fact that Goldberg, I think, elongated WCW's life by probably a year and a half, if not more, um, and kept people's interest in him. You know, and you wonder, had he not, Starcade is a cursed event. You know, everybody talks about Starcade like it's the greatest thing ever. But realistically, NWA Starcade, Dusty Era Starcade, maybe. But towards the end, Starcade in the late 90s? I don't think so. Starcade 97 was a total just botch. And I think it was Starcade 98 that uh, Goldberg's streak ended. And to this day, a lot of people say that that was a, a foolish thing to do, that it wasn't time yet. And quite frankly, they didn't have the next thing in line. You know, they weren't ready to end that streak. But I say all this to say that you can't sit there and say that Goldberg's not good. You can't sit there and say that Goldberg's legacy is not anything short of, of incredible. That he doesn't belong on that list of some of the greats of that era. And that, you know, not only does he deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, which he is, but he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame as much as anybody does. So I say all this to say that it changed my perspective a little bit on how you treat legends. For a long time, I felt like legends were like kind of really disposable. Like the only reason to have legends on the show were to allow the next young guy to shine. And that's not necessarily true because a great legend can make somebody shine. But sometimes you can only do it once. And, you know, I was watching, well, The Undertaker, for example. And to me, I wasn't at all upset about what The Undertaker did. First of all, I think that, well, I saw it going a different way. In my head, I'm like, here's what would be cool. If... And I know you're going to go, it's the same thing you said for Stone Cold, but it, this goes a little further. I thought it would have been cool if The Fiend had come out, if he had laid out The Undertaker, and The Undertaker had disappeared. Then we go to Hell in a Cell, and The Fiend is, is in there with Seth Rollins or Braun Strowman, whoever the champion is, in this Hell in a Cell match. The Undertaker interrupts the match and costs The Fiend the Universal Championship. And then we get our Undertaker-Fiend match at Survivor Series in Chicago. I thought that would have been a cool way to go. But I was not upset with the uh, Sami Zayn getting taken out by The Undertaker because I think in the role that Sami Zayn is in right now, he should be taken out by people. Like, he's not a dominant heel. He's the mouthpiece for Shinsuke Nakamura. So I actually think that him interrupt, like him being taken out by The Undertaker the way in which he was in the sense that he interrupted The Undertaker's segment and then The Undertaker laid him out... Just uh, Sami Zayn being a part of that segment, I think, 
make Sami Zayn into an even more cemented villain. Like, I actually thought that that was a good look for Sami Zayn. Uh, when it comes to Stone Cold Steve Austin, all right, I know I was preaching for a couple of weeks that I want to see The Fiend lay out Stone Cold Steve Austin. I still wanted to see The Fiend lay out Stone Cold Steve Austin. But as I was watching, and you know, it was really interesting, because if you watch that opening segment, first of all, AJ Styles, I don't care what any of you guys say. I mean, I care what you guys say. I value your opinions. But it goes back to uh, what we were saying about uh, 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 Sami Zayn. AJ Styles getting to come out, getting to do his Stone Cold impression, getting to call him old, getting to uh, uh, tell him he's washed up and shouldn't be there, then getting to take the stunner and sell it the way he did, I think it made AJ look like a million bucks to take that stunner. You know, I don't think that long term it would have done anything for AJ to take out Steve Austin. Um, And as I was watching, I said, I, I thought back about what Booker T was saying about the value that these guys bring to the table. And... Realistically speaking, whether it's the fault of the performers, whether it's the fault of WWE, whether it is simply timing, whether it is where we live right now, there is no star in WWE that's as big as Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold Steve Austin is the biggest wrestling star of all time. When you put together that Mount Rushmore, Stone Cold Steve Austin is number one. He's above Hogan, as wild as it is. You know, you can make a short list of the untouchables. It's longer for me than a than a uh, Mount Rushmore, but Austin, Hogan, Rock, Flair, Undertaker. You know, that's five. I don't know which one of those I would throw out to put the others on Mount Rushmore. Honestly, Cena's on that list too, and it's going to take a little bit of time, I think, before we really put Cena on that list, just because. He's still fresh in our minds, but Cena is definitely on that list. Of the those are the those six guys, those are the greatest of all time. You know, I think you know you can have conversations about Dusty. You can have conversations about a lot of people. Dusty might be on that list too, to tell you the truth. But I can guarantee you, those six are the six greatest of all time. Um, which I say to mean that you have when you have one of the greatest of all time in Stone Cold Steve Austin. And he's not going to do a match, but he still looks like Steve Austin. He still looks like Stone Cold. You know, he's still in shape. He still, he doesn't look like, oh, I remember when he was Stone Cold. He still looks like Stone Cold. And he can still do the stunner. Like he can still lay somebody out. I think when, when you have all that happening, you have to be really careful about who and when you allow Steve Austin to be taken out. And I thought about it, and the more I thought about it, the more I felt like if The Fiend were to take out Steve Austin tonight, it would be aces for The Fiend, you know, straight to the main event for sure. But the next time Steve Austin came out, it might not be as special. And certainly the idea of taking somebody taking him out wouldn't be as, as special at all. So... I'm not saying that I'm glad that The Fiend didn't lay him out because that would have been interesting too. But I could see why he didn't. And it was funny watching Seth Rollins in there. It was just funny watching the whole segment. AJ Styles, I thought, looked like a million bucks. And I thought Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman looked like, not only did they look like kids in a candy store, I thought Braun looked a little nervous. I, I, I thought he looked a little nervous. Not in a negative way. But I just thought that I could read... It felt like I could read on Braun Strowman that he knew who he was standing next to. Seth Rollins, the same thing. You know, you can say what you want about, you know, WWE making current stars look like, you know, higher profile guys. And, you know, this makes Steve Austin look great, but it doesn't make anybody else look great and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there are arguments there. I think that those arguments were better for... See, the difference between Raw Reunion and this is that at the end of the night on this, you had Steve Austin with the Viking Raiders and Cedric Alexander and Braun Strowman and Seth Rollins. Like, at the end of the night, you had current roster guys in there. That's why I didn't have a problem with it. Um, 
but realistically, I mean, if even the performers are kind of in awe of Stone Cold Steve Austin when they're in the ring with him. Even the performers, you can tell they're pinching themselves just at the idea that they get to be in the ring with him. So if you've got a guy that commands that much respect from the talent and from the audience, you know, good luck. Good luck making an example out of him. So I thought it was good. Um, of course, the conversation about the ratings comes up. You know, I'm not a guy who analyzes television ratings. Uh, the NFL had a lot to do with it, of course. Uh, and, you know, part of it is where we're at. You know, I think we're still in a slow build for you know, the next big wrestling boom. It's a slow build. But shows are getting better, you know, and shows are good. Wrestling is fun. Wrestling is good right now. Like we're not we're not in any kind of trouble here going like, oh my God, the wrestling business is just, just horrible. It's great. It's a lot of fun right now to watch these shows. So I, the, the ratings don't really worry me. You know, clearly, not only is WWE still profitable, indie wrestling is healthy. You have another promotion being built and somehow Impact continues to survive, which we'll get into later. But, you know, I thought it was great. Let's go into one of the things that happened on the show. Uh, number four is the King of the Ring. So number four, story number four, the King of the Ring. Uh, I was, um, the only thing that surprised me was I thought that the King of the Ring finals was going to be at Clash of Champions and that they were going to consider, you know, the king like a championship, like a title, so you could have that match. Um, I guess not. They announced this week that it would be Chad Gable and Baron Corbin on Raw next week in the finals of the King of the Ring. Um, you know, I hope you guys all are like, yeah, we heard this on Sam Roberts' podcast. You even heard me talking about it with Baron Corbin. I believe him. And I was corrected. Savio Vega was uh, 94 King of the Ring. Uh, I think uh, maybe Razor Ramon or or 95 King. I don't, I don't know. I got my years wrong when I was talking about my Savio Vega example last week. But I still stand by it. It's still, you know, I still think Chad Gable is the Savio Vega of 2019 at the moment, um, which is not an insult. Uh, but I do think he's the good guy, little engine that could, that won't. You know, I think that this this tournament from jump was designed for Baron Corbin. I think that if you look at it, um, Baron Corbin has not really had a character to speak of since the Lacey Evans Baron Corbin mixed tag match with Seth and Becky. And that was coming off of Constable Corbin, you know, ever since they eliminated the GM role and the Constable role, um, Baron Corbin has been, he's been without a character. So I think that this allows us to kind of stay true to that, you know, I'm above you, I think I'm better than you essence that he has the Constable without people wondering, like, why does he think this? Um you know, I think that's a slow transition into him wearing a tank top instead of a vest and a shirt is great. And once he's the king, King Corbin sounds right, and it allows him to change. It gives him the gimmick, and it allows him to change his attire if he wants to as well. So, you know, I think that that's a no-brainer. Uh, I was bummed to hear about Elias's leg uh, or ankle being injured and him being out of it, but I thought Shane McMahon was the right fit to replace him because I think that it allowed storylines to maintain continuity and the fact that there is this thing with Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think that the King of the Ring left us where uh, I thought it would. I didn't think, I think in my original prediction, I didn't have Chad, I had Ali instead of Chad Gable. Same exact story for the most part, except not so many short jokes. Um, but, yeah, it was Ali instead of Chad Gable. It was funny. I guess there were people who thought it would be like Ricochet versus Andrade in the King of the Ring finals, and it's like, do you watch the show, man? I, I don't know why people thought Andrade was going to be King of the Ring. You know, I like Andrade. I could see wanting him to be King of the Ring. I think he's amazing. But, I mean, I think if you watch WWE TV, there's nothing that says, okay, obviously they're going to make this guy King of the Ring. Um, but, yeah. Uh, story number three is speaking of little engines that could, Impact is surviving to fight another day. Impact, who I, I can't believe how long this company has been around. Uh, 
they have found another new TV home. Of course, Impact started as NWA TNA. Uh, they went to they they did a model where it was weekly pay per views. So every week you would pay, I think it was ten dollars, and you get to watch the two hour Impact show. Uh, then they went over. I think it was on Fox Sports Network. Just the cable network, not the network network. But and this is when it was a brand new cable network. I think they had like a an afternoon time slot on one day or something like that. And then they moved to their glory years on Spike TV. Spike TV, which turned into the Paramount Network, I guess. But before it was Paramount Network, it was Spike TV. And they had impact for a while. I mean, for for a period of time, it was so big. You know, people would talk like, you know, the the Wednesday night war with uh with uh, uh, AEW versus NXT is the first time that there's been a rivalry like this since Raw and Nitro. But TNA tried. TNA moved their show to Monday nights and tried to go head-to-head. And I was, like, excited for it. That's when Hogan uh, first came to TNA. And I was sitting there going, here we go. And they brought down the big red cage and, and had that first Monday night TNA show. And Jeff Hardy showed up. That was his big debut in TNA. But I think it was Homicide. I think, who couldn't climb up the orange cage. And that's when I realized, okay, this ain't going to work. And TNA ended up, I think, going back to Thursdays. They had a six-sided ring. They had a four-sided ring. They had a six-sided ring. They ended up leaving. uh, uh, They ended up leaving Spike. And then I think they went to Pop. TV after that or travel TV after that they've had several networks and and lately they've been trying to survive I think they have a network but I think most of it is on like Twitch but the company has survived now Anthem the company that owns uh, Impact Wrestling has purchased Access the Access Network that runs New Japan right now um, with Steve Harvey Harvey and uh, Mark Cuban so, and, you know, it sucks because, this, you know, it's just typical corporate takeover stuff. They double up people, so they got to change people around. Uh, I think a lot of people are getting laid off. I think offices are closing. I always hate hearing about that. Um, but it would appear, like, they're, they're getting rid of the wrestling people on Access. Like, the people who brought and produced New Japan on Access apparently um, are getting let go over there. So it's led people to believe, obviously, Impact will be on access. So now Impact is coming back. They're going to be back on cable. They're surviving. They're still in the, in the thick of it, man. They're still in the hunt. And realistically, in America, you're going to have three wrestling promotions on cable TV. That's a big deal. I mean, it really is like going back to the Monday Night War when you had WWE on USA you had WCW on TNT, and then you had ECW on on the Nashville network at the time, which became the National Network, which became TNN, which became Spike TV, which became the Paramount Network. So we're going to have WWE on USA and Fox. We're going to have AEW on TNT, and we're going to have Impact on Access. Now, as of, as of uh, press time, they have not yet said what day of the week it's going to be on, what time, anything like that. I would think, let's see. I mean, I guess Tuesdays are open. You've got Raw on Monday. you got your Wednesday Night War. And then you got SmackDown on Friday. So I, th- I feel like there's something on Thursday that I'm missing. Tuesday's open. But realistically, I think Impact will probably end up on the weekend. Because you can't even do it. Friday night, unless you do it on like a Tuesday and then replay it late on Friday, like at 10 after SmackDown. So you could like turn over after SmackDown to access to watch Impact. I don't know. There's going to be a lot of wrestling to watch, man. There is going to be a lot of wrestling, but I am happy for Impact. I'm happy when any company like that succeeds. I'm happy to see wrestling succeed. So I think it's super cool, you know, and I think it's unexpected. And I think, you know, the legacy of Impact will be that of a survival. Survivor. I mean, think about it. You had Jeff Jarrett start the thing. You had Panda Energy buy it. Then this woman named Dixie Carter takes over. I mean, Dixie Carter is like, I want to do a documentary about Dixie Carter one day. Just what an interesting figure. 
in the wrestling world, that, that she's just a, a total outsider in this wrestling world. Uh, nobody has really complimented her as a promoter. But somehow she turns herself into an on-screen character. And I actually thought she was a great on-screen character. I thought she's a great bad guy person. And she ended up going through a table. Bubba put her through a table at the Hammerstein Ballroom. Uh, but And then Impact gets sold off to Anthem. And Dixie Carter's never heard from again. And gone from the wrestling business altogether. She jumped in and she jumped right out. There's no stories like that, really. I think that's super interesting. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what, what Impact brings to the table. I guess that New Japan will stay. I'm sure they have TV contracts, so they'll have to stay on access. I don't know if they have non-competes, so they're not going to be able to air Impact right away or whatever. I don't know. The deal's still very, very fresh. So none of it's been made clear, but we'll certainly be following it as it progresses here on Not Sam Wrestling. Uh, speaking of different promotions and where people are going, story number two is all about Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens, uh, I'm going to pull up his exact tweet. Because, uh, of course, the storyline on SmackDown is that Kevin Owens uh, is fired. He was fined $100,000 from Shane McMahon. Uh, and then Shane said, okay, we can get rid of your fine. Because, you know, you can't afford $100,000. It's a lot of money. We can get rid of that fine if you're the special guest referee in my uh, King of the Ring qualifier tonight. Because I really want to win that King of the Ring crown. Shane McMahon ends up tapping out. Kevin Owens calls the tap out because what else can he do? I thought that was a brilliant finish, by the way, because Kevin Owens didn't. He still has this sort of vulnerability maintained where he's like, I didn't I didn't mean to. I, I couldn't. I What was I going to do? Like, I couldn't fix it if I wanted to. You were tapping. And then he gets fired from by Shane McMahon on SmackDown. He tweeted out uh, yesterday, 14-24-20. If you go into the English alphabet and look up the 14th letter, then the 24th letter, then the 20th letter, you will spell out the letters N-X-T. Kevin Owens returning to NXT is what uh, the rumor mills are saying is being hinted at. Now, of course, there's a huge likelihood that Kevin Owens is simply trying to build interest, right? That, that, I mean, Kevin Owens is very, very, very good at Twitter. So he could just be trying to build interest. Um, and, and knows that, that that'll get people talking. It gets the people going. What does that even mean? Um, so that's very possible. I also think that if you were to show up in NXT, like the Shane McMahon story has not been told. Like Shane got his victory. I mean, Kevin Owens got his victory. But then Shane still came back, made his life hell, and then fired him. And theoretically, he still wants his grand, right? So... You know, I don't know where that would leave the Shane storyline. That's the only reason I say I don't know if I buy it. That said, oh my gosh, NXT starts next week. That's huge. So you got NXT starting next week, the 18th. They're going to do an hour live on USA and then an hour live on the WWE Network. That's the first two weeks. And then October 2nd, they're doing their first live two-hour show from Orlando, from Full Sail. So, uh, and it's going to be all on USA. So, I mean, there is this possibility that something happens at Clash of the Champions and it settles the beef between Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon and then Kevin Owens shows up on NXT. It's also very pop possible that Kevin Owens doesn't show up until the second. It's You know, there are 150,000 things are possible. But instead of figuring out whether it's going to happen or whether or not it's going to happen, Let's say for funsies that it does happen. Could be very, very interesting. Kevin Owens is at a very interesting part of his career because uh, for one of the first times, he's playing an actual good guy. Kevin Owens is a good guy character. If he showed up to NXT because he had such a wonderful run in NXT, wonderful. I thought he's one of the best NXT champions of all time. When I look at who are the best NXT champions of all time, I think Finn Balor's on that list. I think Tommaso Ciampa's on that list. Kevin Owens is on that list. I mean, all the champions are great because they're—I mean—they're I mean, they're so good at telling their stories in NXT. Um, 
I think Adam Cole is going to go down as the best NXT champion of all time. If he holds on to it, if he holds on to it for any length of time, I think Adam Cole will go down as the best NXT champion of all time. Finn Balor probably, I think Nakamura's on that list. But I think right now it probably goes Finn Balor. It might go Finn Balor, Kevin Owens. And then, uh, 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 yeah, Bobby Roode might be on that list too. You know, we, we forget because of the career that Bobby Roode has had on the main roster, but he was a really great NXT champion. I don't know. That's probably a whole other show. Maybe we should do a full NXT appreciation show at some point. Um, but all that said, and we'll figure out how we're going to handle the NXT TV show on next week's podcast because the two podcasts a week isn't supposed to start until October. Um, but I think it'd be really cool if NXT, if, if Kevin Owens came back to NXT. Kevin Owens is the type of guy that could hang in today's NXT environment. And I'll tell you what I would like to see. This is what I would like to see. If Kevin Owens were to return to NXT, already he's aligning with bad guys. He's on, on, on Twitter accounts. We've seen him being, he's talking about how he's great friends with Ciampa. And we know he's great friends with Adam Cole. Adam Cole and Ciampa are bad guys in NXT. I think we've had all this stuff, right? We've had Matt Riddle, and he's talked about uh, Goldberg, and, you know, Booker T's mad at him, and Chris Jericho's mad at him, and all the legends are mad at him. There were tweets going on with uh, Ciampa saying that the locker room is telling him to F off, that, and, and uh, Riddle saying that the locker room left him behind. Now there's rumors that uh, the locker room does not like Matt Riddle. Okay. I think Kevin Owens should go down to NXT as a representative of the uh, main roster locker room, as a representative of the SmackDown locker room, and beat some respect into Matt Riddle. I think this culture of locker room heat and, uh, you know, because there is this idea that, like, if you believe the internet, Matt Riddle may be on his way to joining that sort of club that has like Leo Rush and Enzo Amore and those guys that you always hear about having heat to the point that they disappear from WWE. Um, You know, depending on how much of it is real and how much of it is fake, Matt Riddle kind of sounds like he's headed in that direction. So I like the idea of turning that into a storyline and having Kevin Owens come down and, uh, and, and beat some respect into Matt Riddle. I think that's a story that I'd like to hear told. I think that could be really, really interesting. You know, they put uh, travel packages on sale for Royal Rumble. I think it was Royal Rumble. And instead of an NXT takeover, it said that you'll also get tickets to Worlds Collide, which is the event that they were doing at uh, Access. So I also wonder if that means that NXT takeovers will start to exist independently. I loved uh, Getting to be a part of TakeOver 25, that was the first TakeOver that existed independently. That was the one in Hartford. So I'm all for, by the way, TakeOver's existing independently. I think they that way they get their own look, they get their own feel, they get to own the building that they're in. They're not piggybacking. I don't like the idea of NXT feel like it's piggybacking because I think NXT, I mean, who knows? What if NXT becomes, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. What if NXT becomes the hottest wrestling property in the world. It's possible where we're at right now. It's possible. So I like the idea of Kevin Owens coming to NXT, and I think it should be representing the main roster and teaching Matt Riddle a lesson. I think that that would be very, very interesting. All right, let's go to story number one. Let's run down Clash of Champions now. Uh, Good news, bad news. I will not be in Charlotte for Clash of Champions because I'm not booked. Well, I'd love to be there, but I'm not booked. I got other plans. Unless they call me last minute, because, you know, huh, I'd rather be in the main event than breathe. Oh, rest in peace, Dennis Stamp. It's one of the greatest movie scenes of all time. But because I won't be in Charlotte for Night of Champions, I will be here in the Not Sam studio for a live Night of Champions post show uh, f- exclusively for the Not Sam show. So if you're on Patreon, we're going to jump on live video just like we do for State of Wrestling. Uh, for everybody, I think Indie Darling level and above, I think is the rule. Uh, you'll get access to the live uh, post show that we'll do immediately following Clash of Champions. Of course, the audio of that show will be available right after the show is uh, for all 
every Not Sam show over at patreon.com slash Not Sam Wrestling. So if you want to listen to the post show, become a Not Sam show. So let's look at the card for Clash of Champions. It's a big card, bigger than I thought. It's 11 matches that have been announced so far. We don't know what's going to be on the kickoff show, but you can guess. Triple Threat, Cruiserweight Championship. I would rather it not be on the kickoff show. But if we learn from history, it will probably be on the kickoff show. You've got Umberto Carrillo versus Lince Derrado versus Drew Gulak. Um, I think this is going to be great. I think this is a great spot to put Drew Gulak in because Lince and Umberto can just tear it the F up. And then Drew Gulak can bring them back down, put them on the mat, and, you know, and just stretch them out. Meanwhile, he's got to catch them because they're flying this way and that. Um, it's actually been a pretty good week for the Lucha House Party, you know, specifically for Grand Metal Leak and now for Lince at, uh, at uh, Clash of Champions coming up on Sunday. But I do think Drew Gulak will retain. I think Drew Gulak is a great cruiserweight champion. He's a great bad guy. And I'm so happy to see him where he's at in WWE. Um, you've got the Women's Tag Team Championship on the line, which is nice because you've got a real storyline. It's Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross versus Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville. I'm not the biggest fan of the, you know, I'm better than you because you're ugly and I'm not. You know, it's very, it harkens back to the days of Piggy James and and all that. You know, it is in fitting for the uh, Mandy Rose character, but I think we could do better than that. I think we can tell a better story than uh, we don't like Nikki Cross because she's ugly. You know, I, I think that that's... Silly. I don't know. I mean, you know, it, you can't say they they it would they would do the same thing if it was a guy. I think you know they're doing well. We don't like uh, Chad Gable because he's short. So you know, there's there's it's always something. Sometimes you got to keep it simplistic, I guess. But what I don't like is that they've given up on this idea that we don't know if we can trust Alexa Bliss. You know, Bailey said. Hey, Nikki, Alexa's using you. Alexa's using you. And then Nikki was just like, no, she's not. And then nothing. So we just given up on the idea that people were worried about that. I think, you know, that could be played in a little bit more. We haven't really explored. Ever since Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss became like good guys, I feel like it's the, the relationship has been dumbed down. We have, we're not really exploring what the relationship is between Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross anymore. And we're not really exploring what the relationship is. At one point, you were like trying to figure out what is the relationship between Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, but that's not really getting explained either. Um, I think Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross are going to retain, but I think Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville would be good women's tag team champions. I mean, look, the women's tag team championship has not been used in a great way. And I said that there weren't enough women on the roster to satiate a proper tag division. And that's probably wrong. I think there are enough women, but they're just not on television. They just disappear. Remember remember uh, uh, the Kabuki Warriors? They gave them a name. They gave them a manager. They did the whole thing. They just will not put Asuka and Kairi Sane on TV. They're two of the best women in the world. Asuka and Kairi Sane are incredible. Together, separate, whatever you want to do. You know, that's one of those things where you could have Asuka turn on Kairi and and have them have a singles rivalry. Like, maybe you don't have Paige. You know, maybe she's not available to be the manager. Or maybe it just doesn't work. Whatever it is. Split them up and have them have this rivalry. Like, what if we got to the point where we could have a women's match on a pay-per-view that was about a rivalry? No titles on the line. <gasps> and then maybe you could find some time for poor Asuka. I mean, Lord have mercy. She's incredible. Asuka should not have enough time to do a YouTube channel, okay? She should be so busy beating everybody up in wrestling that she has no time. She's exhausted. She just has no time to do a YouTube channel, but instead she's playing video games on YouTube. Doesn't make any sense. She should be on TV all the time. I don't mind any of these four women on TV. I think Nikki Cross is incredible. Alexa Bliss is next level. Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville are everything that the women's tag team division should be. They're awesome. But, like, think about it. You've got a tag division now. You've got Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross as a cemented tag team. you got 
Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, cemented tag team. Iconics, cemented tag team. Kabuki Warriors, cemented tag team. Sasha and Bailey are still friends, right? I don't know. I think Mickey James might be injured, to be fair. And I want to be fair. But you've got real women's tag teams. There's no reason if you're going to have a women's tag team championship. Here's the issue. You've got a women's tag team championship, but you don't have any women's tag matches. You don't have a division. There's no women's tag matches that aren't for the titles. Unless it's like what happened on Raw with the four horsemen women that is really just an exhibition match to get to two solo matches, two singles matches. Has nothing to do with the Women's Tag Team Championship. Nothing. So when it comes to the women's tag division, there's nothing going on. You know, there is at least a a, a little bit of a story between Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville and Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. But... Like, what other tag teams are there? Well, I mean, I just listed some of them. But, you know, why not have women's tag matches every week? Every week we should see, between the two shows, women's tag matches, women's singles matches, and some women's title matches. Like, there's there's enough going on now that we should see all that, and we don't. It's really, really strange. So, I would say keep the titles on Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross because... They're probably the biggest women's tag team right there. And keep them together as a team and let them be the 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 focal point of a real women's tag division. It's crazy. Uh Cedric Alexander is getting the uh United States championship uh opportunity. I love what's happened with Cedric Alexander. I love that uh that they have put him in a spotlight to shine. I, I think that Cedric Alexander is great. I love this match. I think it has the potential to steal the show. I don't think that he should beat AJ Styles, but I do think that this match has the potential to steal the show. Although I think there is actually a, a decent chance that he will beat AJ Styles and be the United States champion. However, I don't think he should. I think AJ should win this one. You've got a match that is not for the title. It's Roman Reigns versus Eric Rowan in a no disqualification match. Um... I was really hoping, I thought the Rowan segment was actually pretty good on SmackDown this week. I like his music. I like his Titantron. You know, I, I, I like what they're doing with Rowan. Um, I really hope that this is leading to a swerve with Daniel Bryan and that they're not just going like, oh, look how big Rowan is. We can make him a main event heel because I think he's better with Daniel Bryan. But uh, yeah, I mean, if if Eric Rowan is not with Daniel Bryan ultimately, there's no way he's going to beat Roman Reigns, right? Although it would be a good look, but I just don't see it happening. I see Daniel Bryan interfering still. You got Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks. I think uh, Becky Lynch is going to retain. Sasha Banks is going to look strong, though. Nakamura versus The Miz. Um, Intercontinental Championship. I could see it going either way. They're finally The Miz is finally winning some matches, but I, you know, I really hope Nakamura keeps the title. I think Nakamura, having Nakamura, Nakamura needs it. Okay, he's just lost so many matches. You know, he's just not accomplished that much in WWE on the main roster. I, you know, I think Nakamura needs it. And like, for whatever reason, lots of fans are cheering the Miz now, and he's losing more than ever. <laughs> you know, he loses all the time. He, I mean, think about it. He's not won one important match since. They won the tag titles with Shane McMahon at the Royal Rumble. He loses every pay-per-view. He lost, you know, his whole rivalry to Shane McMahon. He gave up his SummerSlam match. He's ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would I would hope that Nakamura wins, but I think there is a, a strong possibility that we'll see The Miz as the champ, but I really hope not. The New Day defend the SmackDown Tag Championships against The Revival. I mean, The Revival is a Raw team. You know, I... I don't think they're going to stick around on SmackDown, so I say keep it on the New Day. Honestly, you've got... Oh, okay, you got Bayley versus Charlotte Flair for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Um, I think that Charlotte needs to beat Bayley. And here's why. I think Charlotte needs to beat Bayley, and Bayley needs to attack her after. I think Bayley needs to lose to Charlotte and then be not sportsmanlike afterwards. 
to really cement that Bailey is a bad guy now. I think we can make Bailey a bad guy and we can we can cement that Bailey is a bad guy and Charlotte is a good guy. And the best way to do that is through a Charlotte victory. So I'm thinking Charlotte victory here and then Bailey snaps and uh and and you know, either beats her up or just makes a stink face after it or whatever. I don't want to go full Becky Lynch on this, you know. Um but yeah, I think Charlotte wins. Talking about the WWE championship. Like, let's mix it up, okay? So, Randy Orton is really good, but Randy Orton is so good that he can afford to lose. And that's bad because sometimes WWE will take advantage of that. So, I think Randy Orton should win the WWE Championship at Clash of Champions. I think Kofi should win it back, maybe at Survivor Series. But I think Randy Orton... Oh, excuse me. I think, sorry about that phone ringing. I think Randy Orton should take the title. And I think that that will really, I mean, it will rejuvenate the spirit in, in people cheering for Kofi. I think he should cheat to get it. You know, but I think that it will make it so that this lasts longer. Otherwise, you're going to end up in a scenario, uh, you know, you had the Bray Wyatt, Randy Orton feud where it was just Bray Wyatt versus Randy Orton a whole bunch of times Randy Orton wasn't winning. You have Jinder Mahal and Randy Orton where it's Jinder Mahal versus Randy Orton a whole bunch of times Randy Orton's not winning. Have Randy Orton beat Kofi Kingston and then have him come out on SmackDown next week and call Kofi Kingston stupid, stupid, stupid. I told you so. I told you so. You're not ready for this and you're not getting a rematch. And at Hell in a Cell, it's Randy Orton versus, maybe it's Randy Orton versus Big E. Maybe it's Randy Orton versus somebody who's not even in the New Day. Make Kofi earn that title shot. Maybe bring Vince McMahon back out and go back to the, to the, the vibe that was WrestleMania when Vince didn't want Kofi Kingston to be the WWE champion. Go back to that. You know what I'm saying? Make it so that Kofi has to bust ass to get a rematch. Give him his rematch at Survivor Series after two months of finally working, and then he can regain the title. Maybe you can create another moment, a mini mania moment. And it's an alliteration. I think if 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 you have Kofi lose the title to Randy Orton and then have him win it back at Survivor Series, I think you got a good shot at Kofi carrying you have two options. Kofi I yeah, I think Kofi's gotta carry the title. He, he can win it at, at Survivor Series, and then Kofi can carry the title to WrestleMania. I think your only other option is to really push it off, have Kofi Kingston not get a rematch at all, and have him win the Royal Rumble in January. But I think then you're leading to WrestleMania with Kofi getting, and it becomes a complete Xerox carbon copy of last year's WrestleMania. So, you know, I would have Kofi have to bust ass for two months to get a rematch, and then he finally gets one at Survivor Series. And why not give Survivor Series the juice? I mean, can you imagine Survivor Series? You've got Randy Orton defending the title against Kofi Kingston for the first time. And then you've got uh, Bray Wyatt versus Undertaker. My Survivor Series is looking dope. Just butter. Uh, Then you got uh, the Seth Rollins Braun Strowman story, which is great. Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman versus Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler. I, I don't think... Here's what I think. I don't... I don't think they're going to lose the tag title. I think that they're not going to lose the tag title. And I think that what might happen is that the Fiend has some kind of presence in the match and causes Braun Strowman to lose. And it leads to not a Fiend Seth Rollins Universal Championship Hell in a Cell match, but a Fiend Braun Strowman match at Hell in a Cell. And then eventually Braun Strowman goes back to that title picture. I don't know. I think that there's something to having to still be tag champions after whatever awkwardness occurs um, at Clash of Champions. I mean, I really think that the best... I, I, I think that putting the univer, uh, that now is the time to put the universal title on Braun Strowman and make it a short-term thing. But I also don't love the idea of Seth Rollins constantly losing the universal championship. You know, I, I, so it could go, it could go a lot of different ways. Hey, we'll be here to talk about it, uh, right after the show on Patreon. So, uh, make sure you're signed up. Thank you for being a part of the show this week. We will see you 
next week right here on Not Sam Wrestling. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Follow at Not Sam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe. This has been Not Sam Wrestling. Not Sam Wrestling.